Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I was so glad to see so many of you sign up to join us. I recognized a lot of names on the registration list. So hi to all of you that I know. And to those who haven't met me before, my name is Michelle McNeil. I'm the Executive Director of UMB's Associated Alumni. And uh, we're really pleased to have you with us today for this uh, timely presentation on creating an ergonomically healthy work from home space. So many of us are two months or more into working from home at this point. And if you're anything like me, there are new aches and pains uh, as a result of that. So we're very happy to have Annie with us today to, to share a little bit of advice with us on, on how to help our home environments be healthier for us. I wanted to start by acknowledging that this webinar is able to be presented to free of charge to you because EWI has allowed their occupational therapists to uh, pr uh, provide these presentations to their alma maters. So thank you to EWI for making that possible. Uh, and I also wanna mention that we're in webinar mode for today's session, which basically means that uh, all of our participants are on mute, the video is turned off, so we can't see you. You'll be focusing on Annie for most of the session today. Uh, but I do encourage you to use the, the chat function. There's a little um, bar at the bottom of your screen where you can press chat and you can use that to interact with one another, make any comments, let us know if you need technical help. There's also a little uh, button called Q&A. And if you have questions that you hope Annie can answer after her presentation, uh, type them in there. Uh, Diane McAdam and I uh, will be monitoring those and we'll ask as many questions as possible of Annie after her presentation to try and get them in for you. Uh, also, Annie will be polling you at various points throughout uh, the presentation, and we really encourage you to take part in that. It's really easy. You'll see a poll pop up on your screen with a question. Just answer that question, then we'll share the results uh, to help inform Annie's presentation and also uh, to help all of you see uh, each other's responses. So please do take part in that. And finally, we will be recording the session and posting it online afterwards so that people can watch it at a later time. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that we would be doing that. I am now pleased to introduce our presenter for today, UMB alumna Annie Barnwell. Annie is a senior ergonomist at EWI Works International Inc. She has a BSc in kinesiology and an MSc in occupational biomechanics, both from the University of New Brunswick. Annie is a Canadian certified professional ergonomist and has been working as an ergonomist for the last 15 years in Ontario, Michigan, Ohio, and Alberta. She brings passion and practical advice to her clients in a variety of settings, including manufacturing, food processing, emergency services, transit, and office environments. Annie is excited to present to our UMB alumni today to help those working remotely to do so without musculoskeletal discomfort. I practiced musculoskeletal a lot of times before this webinar to make sure I said it properly. Uh, welcome, Annie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, thanks to the UMB Associated Alumni for inviting me to present to all of you today. I am really thrilled to be here. And I just wanna make a note that there are about 170 of you online right now, which is really exciting. And just so you know, while most of you are watching from New Brunswick, uh, the other provinces in Canada are very well represented. And there's a few people from the United States as well as Trinidad and Tobago. So welcome to all of you and I hope I can help you out. So thanks, Michelle, for that introduction. And as Michelle said, I did do my education at UMB Fredericton. And um, I know most of you are in Fredericton right now. And I know that a lot of New Brunswick has opened up a little bit more um, in comparison to the last 11 weeks. So uh, some of these things uh, will be a little bit more relevant to you. And uh, some of these things will, will not be. But um, we never know how, how this virus is going to progress a little bit. Um, so I'll get right into it. I am going to be taking my video off so that I'm not distracted by my face while I present. And hopefully that will also um, allow you to concentrate on the video and you won't be distracted by my hand gestures either. So I've kind of gone through a bit of an introduction. What we are going to be doing is we are going to be talking about working from home with a little bit of a reality check. We're going to be talking about working heights, which is the foundation for physical ergonomics, which is the branch of ergonomics that I practice most of the time. And we're going to be going through some viewing solutions with computer screens. We're going to be talking about sitting solutions with chairs. 
Um, we'll be talking about standing. Some people want to incorporate standing into their workplace and we're gonna go into uh, the importance of movement. So while I've done a work in many different industries, I have done a lot in office ergonomics and remote assessments as well as in-home assessments. And I know that the last 11-ish weeks have been a challenge for a lot of you because what you're doing working from home, if you are working from home, is very new and different from what you're used to. And because I've seen a lot, um, I do think that I'll have at least a couple of tips that should help you out over the next little bit or if you have to return back to work. So as you said, as Michelle said, um, I'm going to be asking some polling questions. So I'm really excited about those, um, more so for my, partly for myself, but also so that you guys can get some validation for your own experiences from each other. So the first polling question I'm going to ask right now, Michelle, I'll get you to pull that up. So I'd love to see what people are doing. Where are you working? We've got some, some people coming in right now. Maybe we'll just give it another, there we are. Polling is closed. All right, so most of you have been sent home to work temporarily and are still at home. I did expect that um, and I wasn't, I did kind of think that in New Brunswick there would be more people back in the office, um, only one of you. And I hope that's going well. And some of you like, me are still working inside the home. So that's really good. That's really helpful. And let me just see if I can. Move this down here. Okay. Hmm. Why can't I switch my screen? Let's see here. There we are. So it is estimated that about 70% of Edmonton Chamber of Commerce members have temporarily started working from home due to COVID-19. So this was, um, this is an Alberta stat, obviously, and this was from um, a little over a month and a half ago. Um, it's just, it's interesting to see some uh, Canadian data to validate some of the things that we, that I'm seeing in the workplace. Uh, many organizations are encouraging or requiring people to work from home if they can. And um, what's important and interesting to me to think about from, um, from a long-term perspective is that many companies are shifting employees permanently uh, to return to keep working remotely after COVID. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with a few pretty large businesses who've told their employees that they should just plan to work from home until at least December and some to plan to work from home until at least December 2021. So um, some of the things that I can see from that is that working from home isn't going away. While I know that a lot of people will return back to the regular office, uh, some of the things that we're talking about here today are going to remain relevant for quite a while. So Let's launch number, question number two, please, Michelle. So I'd like to know how many of you have always had a dedicated home office? Um, how many people have kind of made one because they've had to? Um, if they do have a home office, maybe they've, they're, they're sharing it with partner, spouse, roommate, and um, my feeling is that many, many, many people are working where they can, um, be it at the kitchen table, dining room table, kitchen island. I've, I ran into somebody the other day who was working from his driveway um, in a lawn chair while watching 
his kids. Okay, so most people kind of have one now due to COVID, which is really interesting. Um, that kind of makes me think that maybe there have been some purchases made and it'd be nice to see what those purchases are and if, um, if how many, sorry, I'm just playing with my screen here. Um, interested to see what, what people are hoping to do for future stuff. So I know that some people, um, when they thought about working from home, they imagined these beautiful workspaces with nice furniture, everything's really thoughtfully put together. And uh, the things that jump out at me most when I look at these pictures is clean and privacy and solitude and quiet, which I know is not what I'm experiencing and um, probably not what a lot of you are also uh, experiencing. So in reality, um, we've got lots of people sharing spaces with children or pets. Uh, some people have been sent to the basement with um, finding camping table and chair to use uh, to kind of escape the family and get a little bit of quiet, uh, maybe even moving onto the stairs for a bit of a change in posture. So the reality is a little bit different from how most of us may have expected it to, to be. Um, so working from home is temporary, but it's a bit of a challenge because we don't know how long. We don't know what kind of invest, investments uh, we should be making in terms of spaces and in terms, in terms of work and what kind of arrangements, arrangements to be made. Uh, not that there's a whole lot of flexibility or options right now in terms of childcare. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we also know that COVID-19 may even have a second or third wave, or there could be another reason for us to be working from home more over the last little bit. Um, one thing that um, we've experienced in Calgary, I'm talking to you from Calgary, is that during the floods in 2013, there were quite a few office workers who were who ended up having to work from home for quite a, a long period of time. but. Uh, that ended up being helpful in the end because then it gave them a little bit more flexibility, you know, after they returned back to the office because they, they did have kind of um, a space to work at home and they did have a little bit of office equipment. So it made it a little bit easier to work from home if their children were sick, for example. Um, but while we're talking about equipment, there are a lot of challenges because we don't have the same equipment that we had in our normal office. And that's to be expected. And most people did not have a dedicated space to work in the home previously. Uh, another <clears throat> challenge is that there are extra people in our homes, our partners, our kids, and our animals, and um, lots of distractions. So what I'm interested in right now is, Michelle, if you could please launch the next question. I'd like to know where you're working. So my example of, you know, um, the, the neighbor I have who, does have a home office. Um, I know he does spend most of his time because his children are younger. He does spend most of his time outside uh, trying to make makeshift um, space and then uh, for part of his day and then he spends part of his day in his office. Okay, so most of you are currently working in a dedicated home office, which is nice to hear. Um, and, and then we've got uh, following up quite closely is working at the kitchen table or in the living room or other. So I'd be really interested to hear what, what those other things are. Um, but I, I, I can imagine. Um, I know I've done lots of uh, home office assessments over the years and it always just it really impresses me how creative some people can be with with their workspaces um, to make them work for for them for their office but also so that they can you know push things out of the way when they're not working so I want to touch on what I think the most important part of 
ergonomics is. So ergonomists like me base a lot of things on elbow heights and eye heights. And the working heights that are ideal for typing and mousing is, is your elbow height, your relaxed elbow height. We want you to have relaxed shoulders. We want you to have neutral wrists and we want you to be, you know, I don't like to say, you know, straight back, but straight-ish back. Um, you can see that the fingers are relaxed and everything is kind of in line with the elbows here in these workstations. And one thing that's important to note is that um, because the type of work that you're doing is light, I consider light work kind of exerting less than about five pounds, um, the ideal height to be doing that is always going to be at about your elbow height, whether you're seated or standing. What I'll get you to do is kind of look, look at these characters here. So the things that I want you to really note in the individual who's sitting is that their feet are flat on the floor and their knees and hips are at approximately 90 degree angles. There's also a little bit of a gap between the front edge of the chair and the back of his calf. So that gap is really important because we like to move our legs and shift around a little bit. If our seat pan is too deep, what we'll do is we'll shift ourselves forward so that we can create that space. And uh, if we shift ourselves forward, then we're not really getting any support from our back. So, um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, the other thing that I want you to really notice with that foot support is that because they're flat on the ground, circulation's optimized and they're not going to be, you aren't going to be as fidgety. Um, movement is really important, don't get me wrong, but the types of movement that I like to avoid is uh, people sitting and perching on the front edge of their chair just so that they can get some foot support and have their feet feeling something on the ground. Um, I want you to be feeling the ground, but I do want you to have back support. So if your chair is too high, putting a foot rest underneath will allow you to get that foot support that you need uh, and also use your back support. Standing to work is, um, is an option that some people choose, choose to make. And I always want that when people are standing, that they're working with their elbows um, aligned with their keys and I want relaxed shoulders. So just because you're standing doesn't mean, just because your posture is changed doesn't mean the workstation doesn't have to change. The workstation will always have to change too. It'll have to rise up to you. So what I want you to do right now is whether you're sitting or standing right now, I want you to roll your shoulders forward a few times and then I want you to roll them backward a few times. And then I want you to kind of shake them out, take a deep breath and exhale and let your arms fall to your sides naturally. So this is a nice relaxed shoulder posture. I want you to keep your elbows against your body and then gently raise your hands to your elbow height. That height right there, that is where I want your keys to be. So we'll move on from there, but I want you to kind of keep those points in mind. So there's a few different things that we can do with sitting. I've heard many concerns from clients and friends and family who are concerned because they're now working at home and they don't have an office chair that's adjustable so that they can work from it. It is a fair concern, but it isn't, the end. It isn't always the end of the world. So what I encourage you to do is to try a few different chairs in your house. The chair that you think first might, um, might not be the best one. Um, it might end up being able to be modified to be a really great chair. Maybe, it, maybe it's a wooden chair that needs a little bit of cushioning on the bottom and on the backrest to give you a little bit more support. Maybe the seat pan is large enough that it can accommodate having some extra pillows around it to give you some comfort. Uh, maybe your work surface is, is really high. Maybe you can um, raise yourself up with some cushions or use some textbooks underneath your feet just to give you that support that you need. 
So while I'm doing this, I'm just going to launch the next poll right now, please, Michelle, and we'll uh, see what see what everybody's sitting in. So do you have an adjustable office chair at home? Okay, so many of you do not have an office chair, which is what I expected. Um, there's quite a few who do have a personal office chair at home. And some of you brought some from work, which is really great. I know um, there's a few companies who I work with who, who said, you know what, we're gonna let our employees take their chairs. We have no idea how long people are going to be out and the chairs aren't doing anything here anyway. So we'll take them out. Conversely, I have quite a few clients who said, you know what, our chairs are our assets and transporting them is not always easy. Um, and, you know, chairs break. I've seen them break and transport from off, like between offices. So then it kind of becomes a matter of, you know, who's going to look after repairing a broken chair when somebody has one of their chairs at home. Um, it, is, it is one of the, um, it is an easy, cheap, option if everything goes perfectly. Um, but honestly, when it comes to chairs, the best chair for you is the one that fits you. So ideally, like I mentioned before, I want, um, I want your, have we shared these already here? Um, I'll just give you a second here to share them or to, to see what everybody else has said. And I'll close this here. So um, I do feel that the best chair is the one that fits you. Ideally, the best chair is one that allows you to get your feet flat on the floor or flat on the footrest while your elbows are aligned with whatever height your keyboard and mousing surface is. In the workplace, many people have keyboard trays to accommodate for really high fixed height workstations. Um, it is not practical to put a keyboard tray on your dining room table. So I'm not going to recommend that. I would recommend trying to find a way to raise yourself to align with that fixed height. So whether that's um, raising your chair, using cushions on your seat pan, um, maybe you've got a really um, thin tabletop and you're able to raise your entire chair in some very creative way uh, to bring yourself up. That would be great. And then a footrest or lots of textbooks to support your feet in your new seated posture. Some different things that you can do for back support are to put um, a bit of like a small cushion. I usually prefer a, a small, thin, compressible cushion that's, you know, maybe an inch to two inches deep because I, I do want it to just fit in the small of your back, that deepest part of your spine to give you a little bit of support at your lumbar curve. Using a great big cushion is most helpful if the whole seat pan is, is just too deep. But if the seat pan is fitting you fine and you're just looking for a little bit of back support, adding something in that small of your back is, is the most helpful. Uh, one thing that I do um, at one more workstation that I work at quite often is I bring a hand towel with me. And I roll that hand towel to be the depth that I need it to be. And then I kind of safety pin it just to the, the chair I'm working on. It's a client's chair. It's, I'm happy to work there. And um, that's the only thing that bothers me. So that's something that I do at that, at that location. Um, you can also purchase lumbar supports, but I've been doing this for a really long time. And I, I'm kind of partial to my uh, towel, to be honest. Um, but there's lots, lots of different options there. Let's see if I can, I, my screen always freezes after I do one of those polls. So viewing solutions. So what often happens when I'm adjusting somebody at their workstation is, um, I'd say nine times out of 10, when I'm starting off an office assessment, I lower people in their chair. People usually are sitting up a little bit higher than they need to be. So once I've lowered them, some people will say, no, Annie, I can't be this low because my screen is now too high. 
and I say, well, then we adjust the screen later. I always start everything from the feet and work my way up. So that's why that's what I've done in this presentation where we start at the feet and, and work our way up. So once you've aligned yourself, um, this is me on in these pictures here. So I'm using uh, the laptop at our dining room table. So I've got my feet supported on the textbooks that you saw in the other location. So you can see that um, I am working at elbow height, um, but you can see from my neck and my upper back that it's uh, flexed forward and not very comfortable. There's a few different things that we can do to make that a little bit more comfortable on the upper back. One thing that I like to do for short periods of time is to put a binder underneath. Um, this is a two inch binder. It raises the screen uh, a little bit, which is really helpful for me. I have, I, I get a lot of neck pain sometimes. So this is something that I do pretty much automatically if I'm going to be working at um, an, uh, an alternative workstation for a little while. Um, this new posture does put a little bit of pressure on my forearms, but for short periods of time, this works great for me. The best thing that you can do with a laptop is if you're going to be working off of a laptop for a long period of time is to separate the screen from the keys. Laptops are excellent for portability and for storing all of your information that you need, storing all your data, um, but they're not really great for ergonomics. So the best thing you can do is to raise that entire laptop and use the screen only. So here I'm using just a standard external keyboard and a standard external mouse. And uh, my hands are still, my input devices are still aligned with my seated elbow height, which is great, but my, uh, my screen is a lot nicer for me to be able to look at. So alternatively, maybe you don't have an external keyboard and mouse, but you do have an external monitor handy. So another thing that you could do is you could keep using the laptop um, for those things and add a, a screen. And then you can use um, your laptop screen as a dual if you want to, just with, you know, kind of like you would with a document holder if you've got um, items that you're referring to or ignore your laptop screen completely and, and then you can look at your external screen. This will take a huge load off your upper back and your neck. So some other viewing solutions that I just wanted to go over very quickly is that some people wear bifocal lenses. And for those of you who don't, just kind of tuck this information away for, for another time, maybe later. But for those of you who are wearing bifocal lenses, who also look through the bottom lenses to view your screen, you may find that having your monitor aligned with your seated eye height is a bit too high for you. And it would be because you'd be tipping your head back. So what I find if people are looking through the bottoms of their lenses, of their bivocal lenses, lowering the monitor by a couple of inches helps a lot. So just kind of tuck that away. It'll prevent you from tipping your head back. So if you have neck pain and you think everything is, is set up well, but you remember, oh yeah, I am wearing bifocal lenses. Maybe, maybe my screen's a little bit too high. Try lowering it just a little bit. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's really, really important to listen to your body. And our body is pretty good at giving us some cues so that we don't work through the pain, which I know a lot of you do. Another just brief thing I wanted to mention is lighting. I do get quite a few questions about lighting and um, it's wonderful to be able to look out of a window. I prefer the window to be to my side instead of directly in front of me, getting glare into my eyes or directly behind me, throwing some glare onto my screens. Um, but I use blinds a lot. Using blinds if you can't move your workstation or your window is a good, is a good thing to do. And also, if you do have the ability to move your workstation around, if there is a, a light directly over your monitor that is pushing glare onto your screen, kind of causing awkward postures for you to move away so that you can avoid them, um, inquire to find out if you can turn them off or, or shift your workstation a little bit and use a, a, task, a, a task light. 
So I did talk a little bit about standing. I want to talk about this one more time because uh, I have noticed that uh, when I do office assessments, people tell me, oh, you know, Annie, sitting is the new smoking. So I want to stand to my workstation, stand at my workstation because it's healthier. And I usually take a deep breath and I say, well, you know what? It's not really healthier. It's just different. Um, static, still postures are, are something that ergonomists are concerned of. You know, we, we encourage movement, taking breaks away from your workstation, taking posture breaks at your workstation is a really good thing to do. But um, with this move uh, to work remotely from home, this could be an opportunity for you to try out standing and see if you like it. Um, what really needs to happen though is you need to be able to stand properly to work. So you can see the, uh, our model here on the left. He has decided, oh, I'm gonna stand to work all I need to do is bring my laptop out to the kitchen counter and stand. And I see this in the workplace quite often, even with height adjustable workstations. People don't raise their height adjustable workstations up high enough. And they'll say, you know what, Annie, I had back pain. I switched to a desk that allows me to stand, but my back pain hasn't gone away. Um, we'll have a conversation about a few other things, but one thing that I really encourage them to do at the workstation is to make sure that everything is set up well. Make sure that your input devices, your keys, your, your keyboard, your mouse, they're still at your standing elbow height. We always start with the person. We wanna make sure the person is set up well to optimize them and then we move furniture and input devices to fit them instead of trying to make you fit something that doesn't work. So we've got a bin upside down that, that works out to be the right height for him to be able to, to type and mouse at his seated elbow height. And we've raised up the laptop so that he can still look at it at, at his eye level. Um, the things I really want you to notice here is the difference in neck posture. And his head is directly over his shoulders, which is really, really good for reducing compression. So um, lots of modifications. Like I've referred to before, the, the neighbor of mine who's working all over the place. Um, these are the kind of real um, problems that I'm hearing about. You know, somebody might take over my space. Um, I need to find alternative spaces. I need to supervise my children, but I also need to get work done. Um, so sometimes it means moving around. Um, I encourage you, if you are going to be moving around, try to move around frequently. Um, at least at least hourly and um, try booking different spots um, if, if you really need to get something done. One thing that's really worked well for me in our house, I do have an office, I've always had an office. Um, I'm just not used to spending so much time in it and I'm also not used to having my husband and, and children around. So when I do need to get some work done, absolutely need to, I tell them and like I did this morning I reminded everybody please don't run past my office screaming and if you do have a question go ask go ask your father <laughs> so um, I don't have have people coming coming in um, but booking booking the space uh, is something that can help um, I just want to touch on reach zones and when you're when we're talking about where things should be particularly if you do have to move some things around in your office um, to make make this uh, sitting or standing workstation work for you so that you can reach everything i want you to go back to that posture where you had your relaxed shoulders and your elbows close to your body and your hands out in front um, i want you to move your hands kind of in a fan motion side to side and everything that you can touch within that, that distance from the, the tips of your fingers to your elbow, I call that the primary zone. So everything is really close. So um, usually the things that we can fit in that space, as you can see in that image, is the keyboard, mouse, maybe a notebook. Um, in that secondary zone requires a little bit of shoulder flexion or abduction, just moving your hand out. Um, out a little bit. So this is where 
you know, I put my coffee in the morning and my water in the afternoon. Also remember that all of these devices are movable. If you find that you're reaching over your keys so that you can type, so that you can write, um, maybe if you're not using your keyboard, you can just move it to the side and then bring your paperwork a little bit closer. So think about um, where, where everything is. And um, I'm interested to find out, I probably should have worded this question a little bit differently, but um, I am interested to find out uh, those of you who are using external keyboards and mice um, with their laptops. So um, this next polling question, if you could launch it, please, Michelle, has to do with um, how many of you are using a separate keyboard and mouse? And I'm going to assume that those of you who are not using a separate keyboard and mouse um, are using the devices on their laptop. Okay, so most of you responded there. And um, many people are using a separate keyboard and mouse, which is fantastic. Um, I'm really glad to hear that. The laptops, um, you know, depending on the laptop that you're using, I have, an, I have a great laptop. Um, it allows me to have, you know, relaxed shoulders and elbows when I am typing. And I'm pretty narrow from side to side, so it doesn't bother me too much. Um, those of you who might need to do a lot of uh, numeric pad work um, might be, um, might find that they are really cramped when they're working in with their shoulders really close to each other and their hands really close to each other too. Um, they might find some tightness in their chest that they just can't fully relax their chest and their upper back. So if that is the case for you, um, maybe investigate looking at separating, um, uh, using, using a, a separate keyboard and mouse. And particularly if you are using the laptop screen at the same time as the keyboard and mouse and you're experiencing some neck discomfort, I would really strongly encourage you to, to try and find a keyboard and mouse that you can use separately just to raise that monitor, um, raise that laptop screen up a little bit higher so that um, you can bring your head back and work with a neutral neck. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is we're going to move on. Um, a lot of us are spending more time on the phone and even more time on video calls. So Zoom fatigue is, is really a thing. And um, I know one thing that I've noticed in particularly is that I used to talk on the phone a lot. Um, I use my headset and because I'm usually alone in my office or in my house, if I am talking on the phone, I walk all over the house. I'm walking all over the place and um, it lets me change my posture. It lets me move around and I'm simultaneously doing my work and, you know, doing meetings and phone calls. Um, but one of the biggest changes just for me personally over the last 11 weeks is that I am spending more time on, on Zoom meetings. And so I am looking at a screen more and staying in my office more. Um, I do stretch, I do move around. The people who I'm meeting with know that I will be doing that and they expect it. And if they don't expect it, then I usually give them a heads up that, oh, hey, by the way, I'm going to be moving around a little bit because I try to practice what I preach. And I kind of think that maybe if I move around a little bit, then you'll move around too. And movement is really important. So um, one prof and employer who I used to work with, she always used to say that your next posture is your best posture. And I love it because it really validates um, any kind of seating posture. So um, when you are using the phone a lot, um, using a headset or earphones is really helpful to make sure that you're not cradling the phone. It also allows you to multitask. You can move your hands a little bit. You might be able to type at the same time. And, um, oh, what was the other thing I was going to say? Something very important, I'm sure. Um, so it does, it does allow you to move a lot, around a lot. The Zoom meetings, when you're on video and you are you know, being watched or at least feel like you're being watched, it, it does make us a lot more self-conscious. Um, 
we're more in tune with our appearance and uh, and sometimes we feel like we're putting on a bit of a performance and it becomes very fatiguing for us um, especially those of you who are spending a lot of time attending zoom webinars during the day for work and then um, due to isolation we are spending time on zoom calls trying to connect with friends and family so it does kind of take a toll on you one thing that i have started to do is you know the people who i usually talk to on the phone if they're okay with just having a conversation if there's just two of us on the phone uh, or just two of us talking then i say like, can we just do a phone call instead and usually they're thrilled I'm like, yes absolutely let's just do a call um, and then we save the videos for if there's multiple people <coughs> excuse me multiple people or for sharing screens and, and working on projects at the same time um, the other thing that I hear a lot of, probably most often, is uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Annie, I, I know that you want me to, you know, work at elbow height and look straight ahead. Um, those aren't the things that are bothering me. The things that are bothering me are are the distractions in my works in my workspace. Um, like I said, you know, even though I have a home office, I usually spend about forty, maybe fifty percent of my time in here, and I don't have have other other people around. So um, sometimes we we are working in a very busy space. Uh, one thing that works for some people is is to have um, one child at a time if they're homeschooling um, close to you, just to kind of set a, a, an example to the child that you know I'm working and you should be working too. Um, that will work for some kids, and it won't work for others, and it might work one day, and it might work another day. Um, but another thing that goes along you know kind of with the phone use is if you do have headphones that you use to take your calls and, uh, and and computer calls maybe you can wear them a little bit more often and that might minimize some of the noise distractions that you may feel which can be really helpful um, there's a lot a lot a lot of distractions out there um, working parents in particular struggling to work and childcare and homeschool at the same time. So I just, I mentioned this because this is the reality for a lot of people and um, it's, it's worth being validated that raising children is a, a round the clock responsibility and um, that's why we look for helpers. We look for our teachers to help teach our children and, and childcare providers to help care for our children and managing work and childcare is not easy and sometimes we need to be making all kinds of different changes so um you know for me personally i added this slide this is me with my youngest child um i try to set specific times to to do things with them and i'll say you know what i need to do you know i need to work really hard for the next hour and then once you know 12 o'clock hits or, or whatever, then we can go for a walk. Um, and then that does kind of help somebody, have somebody keep you accountable. Um, this particular incident happened. It was very, very rainy in Calgary last week. It was very hard to, to get the kids motivated to do things outside. And, um, you know, they decided to um, just be very, very close to me to uh, let me know that they want some attention too. So sometimes um, that means shifting work times and trying to get work done in the mornings early while people are still sleeping or working at night when, that, uh, when the children are sleeping. And uh, that is not always ideal. Um, it often means that some, some people are working you know, 16 hour days just to be able to get everything done, and, which can be very fatiguing. Um, and I say that just so that you recognize that in, in some of your coworkers. Um, and then one thing that I remind people is that what works for, for one family or one child is not going to be the same for what works for other people. And some things change from day to day and week to week. And I think one of the best things that we can do as parents and parents who also work is to share some of the challenges with each other 
and to the things that have worked um, and just to keep an open mind. And this absolutely goes for pets too. I've seen some really great pictures of um, cats sleeping on people's keyboards um, and preventing them from working because they, they just want you to pay attention to them too. So um, this is a big challenge for everybody working from home and um, just do your best. Everybody's trying to. So the next question that I've got here that I'd like launched is, um, you know, how many hours a day are you involved in online meetings? We've got lots of varied responses here. I know for me, I used to be involved probably one to two hours a day and now I'm, I'm closer to, you know, three to five hours a day is, is kind of where I'm at. Um, so that's why I know all about the video and the Zoom fatigue, because I see that. So sharing these results so you can all see them. So overwhelmingly, um, we've got people in the one to three hour mark and, and quite a few of you are still in the more than three hour, three hour mark. So I hope, um, I hope those of you who are in the kind of more than two hours at least, are, are able to use speakerphone a lot, um, able to use headsets to try and minimize some of those distractions. Um, the other thing that I want to emphasize here, I've talked about this a couple times, is just the importance of movement. So with physical ergonomics, the risk, the main risk factors that we look at are awkward postures, forces, and um, repetition or frequency. So um, we look at these different variables and what's causing all of these different variables and we try to manipulate them. If we've got a really great workspace set up and we're minimizing as many awkward postures as possible, then we say, you know what, try to change your posture every 50 to 60 minutes. And a posture change can be sitting back, doing some uh, hand stretches, some shoulder stretches, some back stretches, could be, could be sitting, could be standing. I do encourage you to get up out of your chair and just um, encourage blood flow to your legs pretty often. Um, but something that I really want you to keep in mind is that if your setup is not ideal, if you um, are feeling that there's issues with your work setup, maybe you were feeling like this, you know, two weeks in, and things have just gotten worse. And now we're at the end of week 11 for me is um, things are, are not reversing very quickly. So I do recommend changing your posture more frequently. I'd say at least, you know, 20 to 30 minutes or whenever your body is telling you, you know, that, that there's a problem. Maybe it's because um, there's lack of circulation in your feet, your hands are tingling, your back feels bad, stand up, move a little bit, get that circulation, circulation going. Um, one thing, like I've mentioned, I used to do is I used phone calls as my reason to get up and move. Um, something else is moving to a quieter location. If you have trouble remembering to take a break, um, you can set a reminder. Um, some people set them in Outlook. Um, our company, EWI Works, has a break reminder app that you can download from our, from our office, or from our, our website, <clears throat> and, and that can help you out. Um, some people are noticing that they are spending um, less time commuting, which is really great. And they have more time and more opportunities to, to do movement. So I encourage you to keep doing movement. And if you're looking for resources, um, there's quite a few out there. There's some more Zoom, Zoom meetings types of things that you can do online, some different fitness classes. Um, the Participation website has a ton of free, great resources around for keeping you active um, while you're at home. Um, some people did walk to work or bike to work and now they're not doing that anymore. And, and so they're noticing that, you know, the, the exercise that they didn't really consider exercise before, now that they're not, they're not doing it, um, they're really starting to feel that in their body. So if you're looking for ideas, you know, check out the participation website. It is fantastic. Um, my last polling question, I'd like you to pull that up, please, Michelle, has to do with, you know, 
how much are you moving? How much do you find that you're moving these days? Is it more? Is it less? Um, maybe it stayed the same. I know for me at the very beginning of COVID when we were adding more remote um, programs to our kind of portfolio and services, um, I was not moving as much because I was um, working pretty crazy. And, um, but now that things have um, stabilized a little bit more, I, I'd say it's increased. I'm able to spend more time with my kids um, uh, for their sake and for my sake. And, uh, and it's been really good to make sure we get out for walks every day and bike rides every day. And that's been something that's really great for me and uh, something that I hope I don't miss because I hope I can keep it up once, once we all go back to, to something. Um, but uh, thank you for sharing here that um, it looks like most of you have noticed that there's been a decrease in movement. And I suspect that it's, it's just through, you know, those, you know, minimizing some of those activities of daily living that we're so used to, you know, the walk to the car, the walk to the parking lot, you know, the walks that you take um, with your coworkers at lunchtime um, or during breaks. So try to see if there's some things that you can, you can incorporate that can increase that, that movement on your side. So as we're wrapping up here, I just wanted to let you know that I know I covered a ton of information and um, I did talk for more than, uh, more than my 30 minutes that I had planned to. Um, we do still have some time for questions and if you're looking for some information and set up um, checklists and reminders, um, you can please check out our website ewiworks.com. We have a ton of free information as well as free office ergonomic apps on the App Store and on Google Play. So Michelle, um, you can please open up um, for, uh, for questions. And uh, I do apologize for talking for so long. Um, my screen isn't showing me my clock, so sometimes. <laughs> I think you did fine and we've, we've kept most people on with us. So we have a few minutes. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions that were submitted ahead of time. So I'll, I'll start with those. And then if people want to ask other questions in the Q and A, I'll go and look. So the first one is wondering if you have any suggestions other than getting up often to prevent, uh, hip or sciatica pain. Oh, okay. Now that's, that's very common. So one, one thing, uh, movement, absolutely. As I did mention, and I would say to also just check your foot support and make sure that your feet are on something firm, whether it is the, the floor or um, some kind of modified footrest, just to bring your knees up a little bit higher. And um, what uh, another thing that I have found that people report really helps is making sure that they take some walks, um, some walks that last at least 10 minutes. Um, ideally more than 20 minutes, but um, for sciatica in particular, and if you've got some other musculoskeletal aches and pains, um, just trying to get some uh, repetitive, but repetitive in a good way, uh, movement uh, on that hip and knee joint will, will help increase circulation. Yeah. Great. Um, and then what is your take on standing desks? You gave us a little bit of insight earlier, but someone's wondering what your take is on standing desks and if you have any tips for those setups for people that prefer them. It's a great, great question. And um, with, with standing desks, with desks that allow you to work while standing, um, as an ergonomist, if somebody is going to go out and buy something new, then I do recommend a fully height adjustable surface for them. Um, not because that will allow them to stand, but because it will allow them to sit and adjust the, the height adjustable workstation to align with their elbows really easily. Um, so just to expand on that a little bit, standard desk height is 29 inches high, but most people have a seated elbow height, um, kind of ranging from, from 25 to 29, depending on your stature. So those people who are in the 25 to 29 range are using footrests and are using keyboard trays. So if you're going to go out and buy a desk, buying one that will just allow you to lower it um, so that you don't have to bother with a keyboard tray or a footrest is a really great option. And then 
conversely. If you're able to stand once in a while too, then that's pretty nice. Um, more so because, um, you know, people say, you know, they're really fixed to their workstation. They're on a call, they can't leave it. Um, they're on a Zoom call. Now they can't walk away from their workstation. So um, they're still able to, to change their posture a little bit. Um, I do recommend, you know, changing your posture frequently. And um, a change in posture can just be from a sit to a stand. Um, some people who are working on standing workstations, I say, you know, work for 10 minutes and, and then take a break. But you definitely have to work your way up to standing if you want to. And then um, if you are going to stand, don't throw out your chair. I still want you to sit. If I see people who are standing for prolonged periods of time, I remind them that it's the static still postures that are harmful for, for the back and the joints. It's not the sitting. So being still for a prolonged period of time while standing is, is still not so great for the body. Okay, uh, so we have a couple of questions around types of chairs. So what are your thoughts on stability, wobble chairs, exercise balls, uh, using those for chairs? Are they helpful for strengthening your, your core if you sit for long periods of time? Um, so those types of chairs can be helpful, but I, I do consider those exercise devices. And I used to be a fitness instructor and I taught stability bell classes a lot. And you really need to contract your abdominals and your back muscles, which is great. That is the point. Um, and those classes usually range in duration from about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, using one to sit at, at your workstation for 30 to 45 minutes, I think that that's excellent. That's great. If you have space for a chair that fits you properly and a stability ball, um, then I think that that's good. That can be one of your, your break times, your changes in posture. But um, because they don't have a lot of uh, back, they don't have back support, stability balls in particular, um, it will, you will fatigue and you can change. And I really, I can find a way to slouch on a stability ball quite easily. <laughs> I can find a way to bend over. So yeah, periodic. Okay. Um... So now someone's asking about working on your computers um, for long durations while being outdoors. So if you're sitting in a camping chair, uh, that sounds really lovely actually right now. Do you have any tips for that or any thoughts on it? Um, same kind of things. So if, if you're working, I'm, I'm picturing they're working on, um, on a laptop on a camping chair. So what I would recommend for that is to like camping chairs are a little bit lower than um, like a couch even for example. So I bring out um, at least one pillow or a couple pillows or like there's some pillow desks that I've seen which are soft, which is really nice, but then they have a hard flat surface that you can put the laptop on. Um, using one of those just to be able to have relaxed shoulders and work at about elbow height. Um, it won't, you know, you can't bring the, the, the laptop screen up to your eyes or anything, but just that posture alone, just raising it a little bit with the help from pillows will help your upper back. Okay, now I have a question from someone I haven't seen in a long time. Hi, Michael. Uh, he's asking as someone who is tall, uh, it's hard to find equipment that works, uh, especially if you want a height adjustable desk. He's wondering if you have resources for taller people. Absolutely. So um, there are there are a lot. It is sometimes a little bit of a work and I call things like that job security. And um, the tallest person I've done an assessment for it is uh, he's seven foot three. And I was able to make him him set up pretty well. So um, sometimes you need to, you know, just trial different chairs. Um, if you and even if he wants to send me an email directly, I can give him some ideas of some different chairs that have extended height um, pneumatic lifts on their chairs and then um, being able to raise raise the workstations and be able to just raise the monitors quite a bit um, you know when I when I left um, that individual who was in you know seven foot three um, I think I left him with his um, with his regular desk but I had um, eight stacks like eight packages of printer paper underneath his, his monitor just to get it up. And he says, oh my gosh, my neck and my back feel so good. So there is equipment available. You just have to look for it and he can email me. Great. Uh, someone's asking about indoor office lighting. I don't even know what this question means, but I hope you do. So it says for indoor office lighting, what color temperature is best? Okay. Uh, their home office has no windows. 
Yes. So um, warm lighting, warm lighting is best. And um, I can't remember the, the numbers off the top of my head. I, if you send me an email, I can, I can look at if you're looking at um, the particular temperature and I think of the measurements in Kelvins. Um, but yeah, just it's typically warm lighting that you want to look for, yellowish. Great. I'm glad you knew, that, knew what that meant. <laughs> yeah, I get a lot of lighting questions. So we've got just a few more up here and then we'll, we'll probably wrap it up. Um, so one is asking for tips for using your mobile advice while taking video calls. So you're holding your phone for a long time while on a video call. That's a great question. Oh, yes, that is hard. I will not lie. Um, so some things that work for me is I, I recommend doing a few different things because you'll get bored or annoyed with any one of these things. Um, I'm just going to grab my phone here so I can show. So um, in Calgary, sometimes I use the, the C train, which is the subway system, and um, partly out of entertainment and partly because I have neck pain, I will be the person on the C train looking at stuff like this. Um, not all the time, but sometimes, uh, because like I mentioned, I do have some, some neck pain. So I know that if I'm doing something up here, my shoulders are going to um, get angry with me before my neck will, and then I'll, I'll bring it down. And then I also have this agenda of trying to, to do things that are a little bit off just to make the people around me think like, oh, that's kind of weird what she's doing, but um, maybe it works. So that, um, I also try to support my mobile device on a stand of some sort. So, um, uh, you putting it on books, putting it on a riser, um, putting it on a lot of books and then some other books behind it and then putting my phone there. Um, if I'm just looking at the screen, um, in terms of typing, I recommend trying to keep your emails very brief. Um, as brief as possible and try to save the longer emails for, for when you have a proper keyboard. But it's hard. It's a struggle. I can appreciate it. So we do, I'm just going to ask one more question because we are at, at one o'clock. Well, I don't know what time it is for everyone else, but for me, it's one o'clock. So we're at an hour. Um, but it's, it's one that I'm interested in the answer to you as well. Uh, what would you recommend for someone who slouches often? Any exercises or things to help better their posture? So definitely stretches, but um, one thing that I always do is I try to figure out why they're slouching. So um, one example that I'll use, this might take a minute, but I used to teach swimming lessons. And if somebody is swimming, if, if there's an eight year old swimming front crawl across the pool and, and they're going sideways, um, telling the eight year old, hey, you need to swim in a straight line. That's not gonna help them. You need to say, oh, you know, Johnny, I need you to pull harder with your left hand because I know that most, most he's probably right hand dominant. He's probably pulling hard with his right hand and not as hard with the left hand. So trying to find out the source of what's happening and then correcting that, that's my preference. So I would say that it's, um, there's a, a good chance that um, there's slouching for a reason. So try to figure out what the slouching is and, and then trying to, to fix it. Uh, my experience is that most people slouch because their workstation height is not the right at the right spot um, or their screen is not at the right height or they are sitting forward in their chair because their seat pan is too deep for them and they're trying to just get themselves comfortable and they don't know what to do to get themselves comfortable but starting at the feet working your way up the body will help a ton. Great. Well, I think we got through all of the questions that came in, or most of them. Uh, thank you so much, Annie, for taking time with us today. Uh, we're seeing in the comments that people got a lot of great takeaways from that. Um, and for anyone that joined us late or didn't get to stay the whole time, we will be posting the recording soon. So it will be on umb.ca slash alumni. And uh, it's probably a longer URL than that, but you can start there. Um, so thank you so much, Annie, to you and to EWI for, for allowing this to, to happen free of charge. And thanks to everyone for joining in with us. Thanks so much, everybody. I hope you have a great day and a great weekend. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Right,